Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're looking at the economy. We're at an unprecedented situation economically, and because of that, we might conclude that there's no playbook for dealing with a crisis of this type. The question is, can we learn anything from the handling of past economic downturns, and is there anything we can apply from that past experience? I sat in on a conference call with the senior leadership team from the real estate firm of Marcus and Millichap, so late last week, and attempts to address that question. Of course, we're all in uncharted territory, so it's impossible for anyone to say they have all the answers. Now, 2008 to 2010 saw a contraction of the economy of 4% over an 18-month period. This time around, we're seeing a 29% contraction in the economy in a matter of weeks. This number could degrade further as the impact of the health crisis deepens. Now, we have a relatively healthy financial system compared with 2007. Companies are highly leveraged, but corporate balance sheets have been pretty strong compared with history. If we compare this situation to 2007, Back then, the banks only had $44 billion in reserves. Today, the banks are sitting on $1.7 trillion in reserves in the U.S. They were vastly undercapitalized back in 2007. In 2007, household debt in the U.S. was at 100% of GDP. Today, household debt is at 74% GDP. You might argue that's an improvement. Back in 2007, the economic damage was caused by major cracks in the financial system, whereas today it's being caused by a health crisis. The concern, of course, is primarily for the health and well-being of the population. The secondary concern is on the economic damage potentially spilling over, causing massive loss of jobs, large-scale corporate bankruptcies, and that in turn could destabilize the global financial system. The news media today are portraying the economic numbers with a combination of surprise, shock, and horror. That's partly their job to sensationalize the news, but really there's not a lot of surprise, at least to me, that the lockdown is damaging the economy. The folks at Marcus and Millichap created an economic model that uses a number of baseline expectations. They base their model on the folks at Moody's Analytics. They're estimating that somewhere between 3 to 8 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 will happen in the U.S. and that new infections are going to peak in May. They're also surmising a case fatality rate of something in the range of half a percent to 1.5 percent. And by the way, that's low compared to other projections around the world. They're projecting a 10 percent hospitalization rate that too is low, and they're surmising that infections will abate by July. They're expecting that we'll have an excess of hospital beds, an excess of capacity in ICU beds, and even an excess of capacity of ventilators. So that's a fairly best-case assumption. And if those baseline assumptions are true, then they expect the following economic impact. They expect two quarters of recession in Q1 and Q2, and the beginnings of a recovery in the third quarter of this year. They're expecting the unemployment rate to jump to 9% in the second quarter, up from 3.5% before the health crisis. And they're expecting an acceleration of the economy in 2021 and a return to full employment by 2023. Now, frankly, what the folks at Marcus and Millichap have presented to me seems to be a nearly best case scenario. Yes, the U.S. banks are much better capitalized. U.S. bank reserves have never been stronger. I was also listening to another conversation between Simon Black and Peter Schiff a couple of weeks ago. That discussion centered around the massive amount of debt that's being created and the lack of equity to support that debt. On a global basis, we have about $250 trillion of debt. The banks don't own all of that debt, but the banks are an integral part of the system, and if their customers feel the pain as a result of bond defaults, the banks are not immune. The banks are only sitting on somewhere between 7.5 to $10 trillion of bank capital. That puts bank equity at about 3% of global debt. And if we saw a destruction of only 3% of the debt, the banks would be technically 100% insolvent. The question is, would a 30% decline in GDP, as the folks at Moody's have surmised, be enough to wipe out 3% of bank debt on a global basis? We saw a situation like that only a few years ago when Greece was close to defaulting on their sovereign debt. Greece has a population of 10.5 million and represents less than 2.3% of the population of the European Union. That risk by itself was enough to make the banks in Europe insolvent. Three of France's largest banks were at risk of insolvency as a result of their exposure to Greek sovereign debt. And Greece is just a rounding error on the side of Europe. The solution, of course, was another bailout package and to lend Greece even more money. Now, there were other elements as well, but the point is it doesn't take a large destruction of bank capital to put the banks into insolvency. We know that the scope of the current situation is far bigger than Greece. 
Central banks all over the world are going to be printing money out of thin air in order to try and bring a sense of order to the financial markets. But we also know that printing money is inflationary. And one impact of inflation is the increase in prices and a corresponding decrease in the value of the currency. We're about to enter a period of economic stagnation combined with one of the most inflationary periods in the past century. We've seen pockets of hyperinflation throughout history, in South America in the 1980s, most recently in Zimbabwe and Venezuela, in Weimar Germany after the Great Depression, and of course in the good old U.S. of A. during the American Revolution. The result has been the same each and every time. Every time has seen an economic collapse, a large-scale destruction of savings, and a large-scale corresponding destruction of debt. Part of the new rescue is going to be a massive amount of new debt being generated, and that debt will certainly be a drag on the economic recovery. That drag will be offset, for a while anyway, by lower interest rates. The question remains, if more debt is the solution, when will that debt bubble pop? As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.